which this uh, would matter enormously, I would think, for executive, not just in terms of busting through groupthink. Yes. The tend you know, a high-level executive can get very isolated from the kind of feedback you're talking mm -hmm. about and be surrounded with yes men. Yes. People who won't report bad inf negative information. They don't want to bring the bad news. They don't want you to know the reality of the situation, which means you can get into a kind of distorted bubble of what's going on and you know, pursue something which is kind of you know, a mistake from the get-go, but nobody tells you. So that's another kind of shared blind spot that it sounds to me like uh, this might help prevent. Early in my life, I worked in the U.S. Department of Defense as a civilian uh -huh. in the year of Robert McNamara and the Vietnam War. And some of the most brilliant people I've met in my life were at the high levels of the Pentagon. And literally, Dan, they were walking off the cliff together. They all shared the same group think. They all, re McNamara was so powerful, they tended to reinforce what he was saying. And they just, they didn't look at things some other ways. And I think one, any good leader needs to surround himself or herself with people who will take them on and say, Bill, you know, you think everyone agreed in that meeting, don't you? And I said, yeah, they all said yes. And at the end, in fact, we voted. There are three people back in their office that are so angry they can hardly speak to you because you kind of blew over them and you got them and you forced them to say, yes, everyone agrees. And so I had to go back, tail between my legs and say, gee, I'm really sorry. You know, I guess I didn't hear what you were really saying. And, and open up that, con that honest conversation. So it's not just uh, looking for and appreciating feedback from that special trusted group, but bringing the attitude with you to the office. Yes. And then you should surround yourself with very diverse people. When I went to Medtronic, I had no background in medicine. 25 years in high-tech business, nothing in medicine. So I had a partner who was a medical doctor. I had another person, a PhD, who'd been in medicine all his life. I depended entirely on these people. You need people around you who are different than you are, and their personalities are different. If I come across too strong, we need people to come across a little more thoughtfully. You know, there's research that shows that's an aspect and a sign of high self-awareness. Mm -hmm. Knowing what your strengths right. are, but also knowing where your limitations are. Yeah. And forming a team of people who have strengths where you have limits. Yeah. I think executives need to have that kind of surround in order to cover the full picture. Yes, and it's being willing to admit your weaknesses and your vulnerabilities. And I see that as power. I see that as strength, not as a weakness. That's strength. If I can say to you, Dan, my problem is I'm too impatient. I comes across as too aggressive sometimes, and sometimes I lack tact. And so it often comes across people as intimidating. I don't mean to be that way, but I know I am that way. And so I need people around who can, if you will, mitigate that. And I can be aware of it, and ex by admitting it, by explaining it to you, then I'm accepting who I am. And I'm not going away shamed by it, but I can also see it dissipate. And so I'm not as impatient as I was. I'm There's not something as... else you do, when you tell me about it, when you admit it, when you make it yeah. part of what we share as information about ourselves jointly, it makes it okay for me to bring it up. Yes. Maybe I could joke about it. Exactly. You're doing that thing. Exactly. Again. But if, if you keep it to yourself, then people don't know what to do. So in our You may not know you're doing it yourself. Exactly. You may not be aware of it. Yeah. In our small groups, the first thing everyone does, we're doing them at Harvard, these 3,500 students have gone through the course. Mm -hmm. Everyone tells their story. And they tell the their good, the bad, story. and the ugly. Their life story. Mm -hmm. And then in the, third, in the second session, they talk about how they lost their way. You know, I thought I was on track, and Dan, I thought I was a value center leader until I started playing the corporate CEO game, and I was losing it, and I had to come to my senses. Mm. And then you talk about what's the greatest crucible of your life, mm. you know, and in, in that telling that to other people, they not only know who you are, but there's something about a feeling, gee, you didn't reject me when I told you mm. that was true about me. I was afraid you were going to reject me. You wouldn't think much of me if I told you. I was, I didn't, couldn't attract the good looking girls in high school and I lost seven elections. I wasn't a great athlete. You just kind of shook your head. Yeah, I, I understand that. I got my own stuff. And that level of acceptance gives me a sense of well-being internally and then allows me to focus on the things I'm good at, my strengths. And I don't have to worry about all the things I'm not so good at because I know I can surround with people around me who are really good at those other things. So you're comfortable in your skin, basically. That's the essence. But you can't be comfortable until you know who you are and you're willing to open up and admit who you are. 
I think, I don't, I've never met anyone that didn't have weaknesses. So, but a lot of people have those blind spots, they won't acknowledge them to other people or they're afraid.